I'm coming from the Argus European University Alliance. So I, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to, to share our experience with, uh, with the audience. But also we'd like to do a small poll among the audience. Also, like how many of you are coming from, from Europe first? If you can raise your hand. OK. And how many of you have heard or are involved in European University Alliances? OK, so that's not, a, not a very new for you. But I will stop in a couple of things which could be interested also for, for the whole audience. OK. Yes. So the Arcus European University Alliance was one of the what we call first generation university alliances. So we were selected in the first round in 2019. Uh, however, we have been developing also throughout the years, and that's the current composition of the Alliance. I'm coming from Granada, which is the coordinating university, the University of Granada. And at the moment, we have nine long-standing universities, uh, which is the University of Minho in Portugal, uh, Claude Bernard Université in uh, Lyon 1 in France, uh, University of Padua in Italy, Graz University in Austria, Leipzig University in Germany, Graz University, uh, Austria, I said that already, sorry. Roslav in Poland, Vilnius in Lithuania, and uh, we just incorporated Menuth University in Ireland. As you can see here, also we have a Ukrainian university, which is not a full partner of the Alliance, but they were incorporated as associate partner. Given, you know, we are funded through EU programs, so they have very strict rules sometimes, and that's an allow us to incorporate countries from outside of the Erasmus Plus program. Uh, so we incorporated a university from Ukraine as our way to support the higher education system in Ukraine and the colleagues, uh, both uh, staff and students in Ukraine that have been suffering because of the war in their uh, land at the moment. So universities, that, as you can see, are not placed in big cities, rather, uh, let's say, medium-sized cities, but are highly internationalized are also have very intense links with their socioeconomic uh, environment. So that work a lot and, has a, and they play a very important role in the socioeconomic environment. What we are trying to do, this is something completely new for a world of higher education in Europe, and I will say worldwide, and it's trying to build something completely new, something that didn't exist before, which is a higher education institution that transcends national barriers. Uh, what we like to, to think is we are trying to go through three phases. Uh, we just went through the first phase, which was the piloting, and uh, that was the, the, what lasted from 2019 until last year. And it was our kind of, let's say, piloting phase. Uh, back then, we started with seven universities. As you can see, now we have grown to nine. And it was really laying the foundations. This is something completely new. We were used to collaborating in projects, but not to the extent and to the level that we are doing now. So there was a lot of need in order to get to know each other, to establish their understandings of things, join policies, so really laying the foundations of what we wanted to do further and piloting things that we want to do in the future, but because they were not done before, we had to really like learn how to do them. Very simple examples, joint programs. In Europe, we had Erasmus Mundus, but going beyond Erasmus Mundus was not so easy uh, with many legislative, national legislative uh, frameworks were, were preventing us actually from having joint masters. So that's something that we went through and it was the outcome was not to have three joint masters as we do, at the moment, was to learn and to facilitate the process of having joint degrees. And that was a huge learning experience. Uh, and we want to go way beyond now. That. Now uh, we are on the second phase, which is really trying to build this European University Alliance in order to move forward to the phase three, which will be to actually have the European University Alliance. This is a long standing uh, goal and aim for, for the Alliance itself. So this is something that will not happen next year, but it's, it's coming uh, with time. I will not stop here a lot, uh, but this is our, our mission statement. As you can see, it's for 10 years' time. This is something long-standing. This is something ambitious for us. Uh, and obviously, it's a flagship initiative from the European Commission, but also this is a huge commitment from the institutions that are participating in the Alliance. Uh, the level of resources, not only just the EU grant that comes from the Commission, but also the level of own resources that universities have to put into this is considerable and therefore it has to be worthwhile having it. Uh, and as you saw in the first slide, we are comprehensive research intense university. So obviously we have an educational component, but also obviously a research component, and obviously also a, an engagement with and for society. So inclusion for us is vital. 
and we really consider this central uh, part of the vision of our alliance. And in our goals, I will just center in one of them, which is the topic of the, of the masterclass, which is creating attractive, flexible, talent-based, and research-driven academic offer. So trying to do things in a new way. We are not here for repl replicating the things we are doing individually. We are joining forces for doing things in different ways. So this is like a little bit of a kind of a, a scheme of what we are, very compressed. Uh, but I think it's, it's helpful also for us to understand what we are trying to do in Arcus, because not all European universities alliances have the same approach. Uh, so as you can see, we are a comprehensive alliance. We are really trying to look to the different missions of uh, higher education. Uh, as you can see, from education uh, to the PhD postdoc levels, to the talent development, the research, and the societal engagement. But really, really, really the important for us is we have our communities in the center. So we have the students, the academic staff, and the professional staff at the center, and we really care about the development of our internal communities, but with a clear service to society. So we have micro-credentials as an academic offer, but also we have micro-credentials in terms of helping tele talent development. So for example, in terms of, a, a, let's say, a training offer for careers outside the academia for PhD and postdocs, but also for our researchers in new developments like open science, pedagogical training, uh, but also in terms of entrepreneurship for the colleagues working in the university. Uh, we are focusing, although we are comprehensive universities, we are focusing on, on three main areas, which are, are not exclusive, but uh, we thought that it would be good also to start focusing in, in central, central challenges. Those were identified way before uh, the current situation in Europe. So we were kind of not having a crystal ball, but lucky enough to actually address the challenges that were in about to happen. So artificial intelligence and digital transformation, climate change and Green Deal, and European heritage and identity. So you can see that that's coming from different areas of knowledge, but quite important. And what we try to develop is like tools together to enable that to happen. So inclusion and diversity, plurilingualism and multiculturalism, but also mobility and openness. So for that, we have also put in a lot of resources into different types of a virtual campus, a, a fund for giving scholarships and grants to students that could come to our universities to study. So really trying to have inclusion at the center of what we do. And I would like to focus very briefly in one of the examples we pilot during the first phase and we want to, we want to continue doing. And it's what we want to see as a micro-credential that is coming from the Alliance itself. It's what we call the Arcus Collaborative Program. It's a challenge-based learning program uh, that it, it combines both physical and virtual components. We have carried out two editions on an annual basis. Just to think, we were selected in 2019. The pandemic started in March 2020, so we were really struggled to have the first edition ready. Uh, actually, the first edition has to start and was mainly carried out online. Uh, but nevertheless, we actually succeeded, and it was a very interesting experience. So it was mainly focused uh, on undergraduate and master's students at our universities. And we were really looking at interdisciplinary teams, uh, both from the, from the researchers and academics themselves, but also from the students. So we were really opening this, this kind of initiative to students from any knowledge area within our universities. And it was really to work on a challenge-based research project across, across disciplines in, in two topics, which changed between editions. So the program was structured in three main components. One, the first one was the winter school, what we call it. One of them happened in springtime because of the different travel <laughs> situations around Europe. But we call it a, a winter school, which was really to bring together all the students all around to give them a, a knowledge basis in order to carry out the work that were planned during the program. And also like in terms of lectures, workshops, but also uh, in field visits. Um, to the actual challenges. And for example, one when we are talking about climate risk was to talk to the pro provinces, to the city halls, to see how were they are coping with climate change, what were the challenges they were addressing, but also with uh, cooperative, with business within the different regions in terms of how climate change was impacting their business sector. With an interdisciplinary approach, uh, climate risks, for example, from obviously from the hard sciences side, but also what was the implications in terms of humanities or social sciences, regulations, etc. 
Then there was a, a research project. So the, the group of students who were grouped, uh, among the group of normally of four or five students that will work locally. Uh, they will actually identify a challenge and they will work on that research project, being mentored by researchers, obviously. And they will be mainly working locally, but also with the international online learning modules that were shared among the different um, groups of students in the different universities. And as I said, they were uh, supervised by the, by the researchers at the university. And then a final a student-led forum where they were sharing what they did during the research project. And they were also moments of peer assessment, of sharing, and trying to share also good practice among them. Uh, and also trying to see possible synergies between those uh, research projects. And that was the final assessment of the collaborative program. So as I said, we have two editions. The first one was on climate risk. The second one was on diversity. Uh, and for example, in the second one, we have uh, 56 undergraduate students that actually were able also to, to travel and to participate in the fully uh, talents-based program. This was very interesting. We have very interesting also stories from their side, but also for us, because this is not a university doing a program. This is a collective for from, from several universities back then to do a joint program in terms of a micro credential, so not, not a really bachelor degree, but not a master, but a, a, a program on itself. So they will receive a certificate from the Arcus Academy, uh, which is from the Alliance itself. And there were the possibility for ECTS recognition. However, there was diversity on the recognition approaches. So not all universities had the same level of recognition or the same level of credits that were recognizing these students for the same amount of work. So there was a little bit of a challenge there where some universities were recognizing this by an amount of credit that was different from others. Others even didn't have the possibility of getting fully recognized within their higher education institution. And there were several students that didn't seek ECTS recognition. Uh, some of them because they said it was not worthy for them to deal with all the bureaucracy. Others because they were simply not interested. So there is a, a downside uh, from that. And, and I think also the part of not interested in the ECTS recognition is also something for us to reflect upon. This is a completely different story, but I brought also here to the room because I think this is also quite interesting to reflect. As you know, the European Commission is now talking a lot about the European degree. And they started by talking about the European degree label. They talk about this European degree about, uh, 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 let's say, specific features of degrees within Europe, of uh, joint degrees, uh, that will be specific of European Union, let's say, level. Uh, we actually won one of those pilot projects for a label on itself. And we will be running for the next 12 months. We just started. And we are collaborating with other three alliances on it. But also, personally, I would like to see also a reflection on joint programs, not in terms of, uh, let's say, a bachelor or master degree joint programs, but also an European approach uh, for any type of joint program in the future, also including micro-credentials. Uh, what we will do at the moment is focusing on on four countries where we see that, that the framework is more rigid. So we are focusing in France, Italy, Portugal, and Spain. And we will really try also to look to the global attractiveness of such a label uh, for the rest of the world. So really not looking inwards towards Europe, so what could be the utility of this, but also what will be the interest outside of Europe on that. And also for us will be also to reflect on, on this label, not only for the official degree in terms of bachelor or master level, but also for other type of joint programs that will happen within our universities. So some of the questions uh, from my side, and I, I were adapting them during the, the coffee break because I thought that the conversation was really going on, on this field. It's, is this a new hype? Because we were talking about lifelong learning for how many years? And that reminds me sometimes a little bit, I'm playing evil advocate here, but that reminds me a little bit of, about MOOCs. Everybody was talking about MOOCs 10 years ago. So are we really new? In, in a new hype, and what micro-credentials are good for, why we are here for, why our employers are paying our salaries. Is this worth it? So let's, let's try to answer that one first. Can micro-credentials really widen learning pathways? I do think so, but we have to be smart on how we offer that. Can micro-credentials improve completion of higher education? 
the stackability of micro credentials, how they work, how they are structured, how they are fit or not into the different qualification frameworks within each country, and how these qualification frameworks between countries actually talk to each other. Uh, can micro credentials promote societal inclusion? That goes very much along completion of higher education, but not only. And can micro credentials enhance employability, upskilling, and reskilling? That's for dropouts from higher education, but also people that are working and they want to develop in their professional careers, and so on and so forth. And it was said also before, before the coffee break, people that not might have the, the enough time to go through a full degree seeking program, but they want to take some pieces and later on they will get a full bachelor or master degree at a later stage. But what happens if you are really taking this micro credential, one from France, one from Italy, one from Spain, can you really stack them together? You cannot even do it within the system, so try to think internationally. Uh, so for me, some, some of the reflections, and you were seeing many policy papers from the European Commission, from the OECD that was published also recently, but for me, what's very important, and some of the reflections I wanted to share with you, is the need for remaining diverse and flexible. Uh, so really, we should not put a framework that will get them very much stuck into a box that then the micro credentials will be completely useless. So in terms of tar types and target audience, that's what I meant. We, I saw you an example of a micro credential for students but also that we are working in terms of a career development for our staff and researchers. So depending on the level uh, of your target audience, then your micro credential will be fit into the different qualification framework level. The delivery modes, sometimes the, I, I get that the conversation gets to a completely digital aspect. So micro credentials doesn't mean that it's fully on an online mode. The design and assessment, uh, so that there is flexibility in the design and assessment, and that has an implication to my next question in terms of need for a college assurance. If we really try to impose very strict college assurance procedures, then that's going to lose its flexibility in terms of design and assessment of the micro credential approaches. And the workload, I'm also extremely worried that we'll really try to, to put a framework which is very strict and uh, doesn't allow for different types of workloads for those micro-credentials. So the need also to have trustworthy learning offer and certification, so both sides of the coin. The offer has to be trustworthy, but also the certification that will come afterwards. And therefore, the need and role of quality assurance, so how quality assurance can help us on that and really help us and not being uh, uh, a corset to these approaches, but also coming from a higher education institution and being working in higher education uh, for a while, I put an entry point because this is really an entry point for an increasing collaboration between the social economic sector and academia on its educational mission. Universities are super experienced in collaborating with the social economic sector in research, in societal engagement, but not so time, not so much on educational aspects. So really, if I'm a public authority that is having a challenge and I need to address something, maybe I can collaborate uh, with a higher education institution. If I'm a a small cooperative, which I'm not a big multinational, and I cannot develop my own programs, maybe I can talk to the university, which is just around the corner, and develop a micro credential together with them. So the universities really have the experience and expertise in dealing with education, in certifying, in quality assuring the, the educational offer. And the business sector has the, the, really the, the, the grounding part in terms of being really grounded to the societal needs at the moment. So this could be also a good moment of entry point for collaboration also, not with the big business sector, but also with small companies and cooperatives and the small public authorities uh, within our socioeconomic sector. And I will really stop here and trying to answer and hope you also try to answer some of my questions. Thank you very much.